Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We have with us Kathy Davis, who has been working with something called the Healer Within Project. Kathy is quite well known in the New York area. She has been teaching Qigong for a number of years. She has a wonderful show on WBAI called Heart of Mind that actually I've been on a number of times as a guest of hers. So I'm very particularly pleased, in fact, to have her on A Better World with us today. Kathy is going to be speaking with us today about Qigong, which is very much the passion of her life. She's been working with people across the city and elsewhere. First she was studying it, of course, and now she's been teaching it for some years now and really making an impact on people's lives. So we're going to look at Qigong, look at what it is, and how you too can practice, if you'd like, learn it and practice it, and make it a part of your daily health routine. So Kathy, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very glad to be here. Good. I'm so glad. So, it's been a while in coming, huh? Absolutely. <laughs> but Absolutely. all good things take time. So Absolutely. Right? Especially when we're talking about Qigong. Exactly. It's been around for a very long time. That's right. So there's so no need great. to rush, right? We're taking we're on Chinese time now, right? Mm -hmm. Chinese clock. How did you first get interested in it? By accident. Yeah. I was doing some race walking in the park. And a friend of mine crossed my path and said, you know, I'm going to check out this crazy thing that's going on in the park, a class. Why don't you come along? A crazy thing. And I said, why not? It might be fun, yeah. something different. So I went to this class, and it turned out to be a Qigong class. Oh. And in Central Park. In Central Park. And I was taking the class. No, I was at the time training as a marathon race walker, so yeah. I was exhausted. I was tired. I had done a lot of miles. And I went to this class and I felt like, you know, I don't really know if I have the energy for all this. But I did the class and at the end of it, I felt better than I had before the workout. Yes. So I said, well, there might be something <laughs> to this work. And there may be. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I started going back. Every mm -hmm. Sunday I would go to the park, do a little workout and do some Qigong. Wow. And then gradually I got seduced by the Qigong yeah and that was really what I wanted to do and I just began to follow a path um, to study it yeah. and gratefully I was given a lot of opportunities to cultivate that practice I see that's interesting it's also interesting to note that race walking is in like utter complete contradistinction to Qigong except that I was a very slow race walker <laughs> <laughs> So in I that see. regard, it was similar. Right. Maybe you were really dusted for Chicago. Chicago in right? the first place. <laughs> exactly. So, um, but, you know, that's where the similarity kind of ends. Yeah. Um, except that Qigong practice does give you some of the same benefits mm -hmm. as you would if you were race walking. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. it's the deep breathing, it's the bringing the oxygen into your cells, yes. it's the... Um, moving and exercising of your muscles or doing it in a different way but you're really accomplishing the same goals exactly but it's interesting to note Kathy though that the the world view of the two sports if you will mm -hmm. are in utter contradistinction to each other absolutely you know yeah. one is moving as rapidly as you can in one direction mm -hmm. you know and using your body in a very specific way um, where things go toward tension and in Qigong, it's just the opposite. It's more like the tortoise, you know. Right, and you're moving and as slow as you can. You're moving as slowly as you can, exactly, and as slowly as you can. Mm -hmm. And the entire idea, one being internal, one being external, you know, mm -hmm. it's just... It's, so you made quite an interesting transition there. Absolutely, and it was um, a lot of fun. Yeah. That those first classes were kind of a remarkable discovery for me mm -hmm. because I had always been a very um, contemplative spiritual person mm -hmm. but I had kind of separated that spirituality from my activity and the Qigong practice allowed me to merge these two aspects of myself into one practice oh. and that was very special for me. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Just the idea for instance of wedding um, a spiritual 
attitude, if you will, mm -hmm. with movement, with mm -hmm. motion, is not something necessarily so popular in the West. Or even understood or, or, or yeah. contemplated. This is true. I mean, if you think about the Western traditions of, mm -hmm. of Christianity, of Judaism, and they, I don't really know of their equivalents in something like Tai Chi or Qigong. It's more that you sit or you and meditate mm -hmm. or you pray or, as you say, contemplate, mm -hmm. but you don't actually bring that into movement. But for the Chinese, mm -hmm. everything is like one gestalt, you know? Absolutely true. And, and, and Qigong and movement are part of the spiritual way in China. So, right. like, you know, when you talk about Taoism, you're talking about the way, the path, which suggests movement. And so their spirituality is a moving, living spirituality. Exactly. And Qigong represents that. Exactly. How would you define Qigong? Qigong, before the name itself became popularized, because that's actually a modern name. Mm -hmm. It was created um, maybe 50 or 60 years ago when Qigong became popular in China. Before that, it was considered, and it was called, the Healthy Living Method. Mm -hmm. And that's really how I refer to it now, as the Healthy Living I Method. See. And Beautiful. so Qigong is a way of living and existing in the world. The practice is a teaching method so that we can begin to internalize these healthy living methods. Ultimately, you want to do Qigong more than as an exercise, but as a way of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it includes a certain perspective on there being a center inside a human being, Mm -hmm. and a flow that's internal and external at the same time. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because Qi basically is at the centerpiece mm -hmm. of this. Yeah, I like to um, talk about the whole energy phenomenon or Qi phenomenon by taking it out of um, the Chinese cosmology and putting it into uh, the American way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And. I always ask people to think in terms of their own body, their own physical structure. When you break down our physical structure to its smallest level, you'll find that there's an atom that come together to make molecules, that come together to make our DNA, mm -hmm. and come together to make the cells. So if you look at yourself at that, fin that finest point of the atom, you've got a positive and a negative force in an attraction with each other. And it's the positive and negative force of each atom that causes two atoms to be tracked together to form a molecule, and so on and so on and so on. So that ultimately, we are energetic beings. And that's essentially what Qigong is telling us, that the <coughs> living yeah. universe, physical matter, has as its foundation an energetic force. And Qigong is the science to understand that energetic force and, it's, and how it is reflected in our physical domain, what we consider to be our physical domain. So Qigong can be represented, or Qi can be thought of as essentially energy matter. And energy matter has a lot of different characteristics, like water. When water is fluid, it flows in a stream. When you freeze it, it's solid. When it's steamed, it's mist. Qigong and Qi is like that. Our physical body is the frozen Qi. Mm -hmm. And the streams of energy flow through us is the, the water, um, the blood. Yes. Um, the, is like the Qi that flows. And the steam and the mist is more of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. So it's all Qi. It's just a question of looking at how it's formed and how it combines into yes. our being. So to, to practice Qigong is really to practice the science of being a human. Mm. Beautifully put. Mm -hmm. It's really a nice metaphor. Mm -hmm. It's often used, uh, the idea of water as an equivalent for understanding the flow mm -hmm. and flow of chi, and yet using also the frozen imagery of the water mm -hmm. and, the, and the air or the misty, 
-hmm. vaporous part is also, it just fills it all in really very yeah, magnificently. The, yeah, so That's that you can beautiful. sort of get an understanding of why um, we have so many different ways of explaining how chi functions in our body. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And the different levels of consciousness, if you will, mm -hmm. that it moves through. Exactly. From the seemingly more solid. Mm -hmm. And of course, what we refer to as a solid body is really not solid at all. Not at all. You know, what it is, since you brought up the, the image of the atom, mm -hmm. it's mainly what exists between the nucleus mm -hmm. and the electron is space. Mm -hmm. And you can keep putting your finger, if you will, um, uh, to put a finer point on it, through in, that, space. that space. And it keeps going and going and going infinitely. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that is what our body consists of primarily. Mm -hmm. Now the Tibetans have it, the Chinese understand it, but that's something that quantum physicists may understand. They're beginning to um, explain scientifically what's happening oh, in yeah. the energy world and Definitely. what's happening in many ancient philosophies. Exactly. It's and proving to be scientifically sound. That's right. I mean, what is scientifically proven and sound is that you and I are both space. <laughs> it doesn't look out. that way. and spaced <laughs> out, right? Sometimes, right? From time to time. For sure. Yeah, For sure. yeah. So, um, so when, we, when we think in terms of the Qigong practice, and we begin to, to study the various aspects of it to understand how to use it for our own health, we look at it from a number of different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you are practicing Chinese medicine and you're an acupuncturist, and then you're, you're really working with the channels of the meridians of the energy as it flows through your body mm -hmm. and how those meridians support your organs. And um, so it's a question of regulating the flow. It's like you have um, yes. a series of rivers and block chi becomes like a dam and you go in with a little acupuncture needle and you change that unblock and you it. unblock it and then the chi can flow. Mm -hmm. And um, But when you're working with qigong practice it, you're, cons you're considering that aspect of the chi sure. but you're also looking at your body more as a whole vibrational being. So for instance our heart has its own vibration, its own signature, and that's why it's a heart. The liver has a different vibration. Yes. And with the Qigong practices, what it's asking you to do is to cultivate your mind to the point that you can be able to affect the vibration of each aspect of your body to be able to open and regulate the vibration of the various aspects of your body. So it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't ask you to focus in necessarily on a particular channel, on a particular point. It, uh, it asks you to relax your mind, open the awareness of your mind, allow your mind to have an awareness of your body, and by your conscious thought, make a change. Mm -hmm. And the assistance is with the breath and with the movement. So it's your mind that's actually initiating a change, and your breath and movement is carrying that initial thought into the physical realm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is an old phrase that the E moves the chi and the chi moves the body. Mm -hmm. And the E is the mind. And, of course, the chi then is the governor of the body. Mm -hmm. The body does not move. The body is that solid, frozen idea until there's the spirit of the thought, mm -hmm. a push, the incentive to the chi mm -hmm. to move it. Yeah, that's a good description. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very good description. So why then would people come to classes and study? What is it that you find is there motivation and what is it that you feel they can get out of it? What can it yield? I think the primary motivation for people is stress. Mm -hmm. This is New York City. Just getting from your house to work is a stressful experience for huh. a lot of people. Yeah. And Subways, then, et cetera. Yeah, um, the crowds, 
And, and then going through your day at work for many people is a very stressful experience. Yes. And then you add to that the complication of your relationships, which are often stressful. So people are wound so tight that they don't even know how to relax very often. Yeah. They're not able to sleep. They're not able to digest their food, even if they're eating a good diet. So most people come to class to be able to really relax, to be able to relearn how to breathe, mm. to be able to feel comfortable in their body, to be able to experience a sense of peace and pleasure in their body that's not conditional on some other factor. So what Qigong is is that you can take whomever you are, wherever you are in your life at that moment, whatever experience you might be going through, and just with yourself, bring yourself into a state of calmness and peace and relaxation. So the practice is a way of giving you some self-empowerment. You may not be able to change your job, you may not be able to buy a car, but if you can breathe constructively, then you can dispel that tension and create a little space for yourself mm. and remember who you are. Mm. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. Remembering who you are is worth everything. <laughs> yeah, know? because we are sure. so um, far separated from that. Yeah, everything in our exactly. in in the uh, oh. in the world, I would say, in the corporate world, really separates you from a true sense and a true awareness and experience of who you are. Sure. You can, might mentally think about it, you might have an idea, you might think about what your image is, yeah. but to have a real organic experience of yourself is rare. Exactly. And that's one of the goals of Qigong. Exactly. There is this, we live in a material world mm -hmm. with a material perspective. And one of the beauties of the Chinese way of life is that they just don't understand the separation between spirit and material like we do in the West. It is Very one true. integrated system. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they, of all people, were able to bring spirit in with movement. Because movement is, you know, it involves the use of the material body of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's easy to do that. It's no, there's never been a separation, nor will there ever be. For that's us, we live a material existence where we make money and we work and we do all of this. Mm -hmm. And then we have our spiritual life where we sit on a cushion and we merge with, with ourselves or our creator or however we conceive it. Mm -hmm. They operate different in, venues yeah, in, in separate, our lives. In separate realms. So um, you're talking about actually the beauty of Qigong and the practice is wedding them together. Mm -hmm. blending these two seemingly separate aspects or poles into one harmonious whole. That's very true and um, very very often and most often with the Healer Within Project we are sponsored by various churches throughout the city mm -hmm. so um, the churches are are very liberal and open and they have multi-denominational churches often mm -hmm. so from the leadership's perspective um, these are pastors who are very supportive and open, but sometimes with the fellowship and the people who come in, they're very cautious and very scared and don't quite understand what this is about. And my way of, of really bridging that gap for them is I say, <clears throat> well, what does a deaf person do? they speak with their hands mm -hmm. and Qigong is simply praying with your body <laughs> beautiful so it's a way for yeah. them to understand that they're interpreting their spirituality through their and through their breath and mm. through their connections so Qigong is not just breathing and moving your body it's actually energetically merging into the consciousness and to the energetic vibration of the cosmic source, mm -hmm. which some people call God and some people call other things, some people call Buddha, um, some people call Buddha nature, Tao, and right. all these concepts. 
but um, it's a way of merging with that energy vibration and actually experiencing it. And also it allows you to merge with the vibration of the earth, which is also a sacred part of our cosmology. Yes, indeed. So it allows you to view yourself in a different context. So it's not a question mm -hmm. of, am I wearing the right clothes? Am I the right size? Do I have the right language? Am I the right color? It's a question of understanding that this cosmology of this planet, of the cosmos, the space, the source, has through an enormous effort given birth to our being. And that energy is still there to sustain and hold us and mm -hmm sort of move us forward into the evolution that we're a part of. So Qigong is a way of going into a conscious partnership with that movement. Mm, beautiful. Oh, you are a good teacher. <laughs> this is really a pleasure for me okay. to hear yeah. you. You've given the practice a lot mm -hmm. of thought and consideration mm -hmm. of how it really operates both internally and in the world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's really very evident to me well, that you. you've spent time with it, and mm -hmm. cultivated the chi around it. You know. Yeah, it's, it's been wonderful. It's yeah. really been, for me, a coming home. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's kind of an unusual thing because clearly I'm, I'm an African-American person, mm -hmm. not Chinese. Mm -hmm. And, well, you know, that just is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, on the surface. <laughs> on the surface. Internally, I'm not thrown by We're not even going to go, that, go there. But, um, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, because a lot of my students actually have a, a multi-racial um, following. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of people who are, and I speak to other people who are African-American, they're like, well, why don't you study African healing? You know, why don't you, you know, go into that? Why don't you really go into your roots? And, and I have an enormous respect for African healing, mm -hmm. but I found that I needed to follow the direction of my heart, and this is where my heart has taken me. Yes. And I, I approach it with a great deal of sincerity and, and love. Yeah, well, that's clear. Mm -hmm. That's clear. Mm -hmm. Talk about appearances, you know. I first started studying Tai Chi Chuan uh, up at Bard College uh, back in the mid-70s. I'm dating myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, with a, uh, a guy, well, let me just say, when I first thought about studying, I, I got very excited because I thought there was going to be some beautiful man wearing long white robes who was going to like you know, prance in or gently mm -hmm. flow in, I should say, into the room to teach us. And it was this deeply spiritual thing. And instead of that, that was just all my imagination. Instead, we got this bald-headed, pot-bellied Jewish guy from Brooklyn <laughs> who was an engineer <laughs> named Lou. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I looked at him, smoking cigarettes and all that. So I said, you've got to be kidding. This is my Tai Chi teacher. And yes, that was him. And not only that, but every time we would go to do a move, he would hit us and say, not like that, relax, mm -hmm. you dummy. You know? It's like, this is incredible. How could this be? But when I watched Lou move, mm -hmm. and it took me a while to tune in, but when I did, I saw that I was in the presence of a master. Mm -hmm. And when he did this, his face, his little Jewish face, became Chinese looking. And I kid you not. And I know I'm not you surprised. know you can I'm connect not at this all surprised, yeah. because his eyes literally took on an oriental look. So the fact is we are all beings all the time. We just don't recognize it. Yes. And this really is just the very most outer cover. But just just below the surface is every other being. Mm -hmm. and from every race and every walk of life, you know. So. That's true, and, and that also reflects the holographic nature of the, yeah. our existence, exactly. where um, in everything is a reflection of everything else. So exactly. that's very true. Exactly. That's very true. And, and it sort of um, goes back to shamanic um, healing, which is where the Qigong practice actually began. It mm -hmm. was a shamanic practice. In, yeah very, very ancient times of China yes, before exactly. it got into 
the temples and was yeah. cultivated by the monks. And made more formal. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Well, Kathy, it's just been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. And uh, we will be continuing with this dialogue for the benefit of all listeners and viewers. Oh, and uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's rich because mm -hmm. this is presenting a really different point of view. And Qigong has become also quite popular mm -hmm. in this country. And people hear it, and it becomes automated, mm -hmm. and they don't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. And they get develop an association, because that's just the nature of the mind. And to, to hear you go into some depth about it, mm -hmm. and what it is very practically, as well, as well as philosophically, really can ground this for people. And they can really get, I believe, from watching and listening, um, a whole other level of connection to the science, you said, of, mm -hmm. of having a healthy living. Healthy living method. Ha healthy living method, right? That mm -hmm. sounds so Chinese. Mm -hmm. I just <laughs> love them. <laughs> and right. in fact, Kathy and I have both been in China uh, on Qigong trips Absolutely. Um, in the recent past. Mm -hmm. So we know what it's like in its indigenous culture, mm -hmm. actually, to practice and be in the mountains with the practicing. Absolutely, the land Chikung is so masters. powerful, really and you is. can feel it in China. And the mountains, we both feel mm -hmm. that way about mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you. We will thank be you. continuing, and uh, I really, really respect and appreciate what you're doing in the world with your practice. And thank your you teaching. very much for having me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is Mitchell J. Raven for a Better World. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Hello, and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host, Mitchell J. Rabin, and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today we're going to have another very interesting show. We are continuing with a dialogue with Kathy Davis, who teaches Qigong here in New York and is the director of the Healing Within Project. Kathy also has a wonderful program on WBAI called Heart of Mind, and it's something you should really tune into. And uh, we're going to be speaking about our experiences of the Qigong world, uh, the practices of the Chinese and Tai Chi Chuan, and the role of alchemy, in particular internal alchemy, and what that gives, what that yields to one's spiritual and material life, since the Chinese don't understand that there's a difference. And we'll be talking about the importation of these ideas onto and into Western soil. So we'll be continuing on with what we've been talking about with Kathy, and uh, I think you'll find the development of these ideas to be rich as well. So Kathy, thanks so much for joining us again today. Glad to be back. Good, good. With the Chinese, there's sort of like no end to the to the wealth of the culture, Very you true. know? While they have uh, long regarded themselves as the center of the earth, <laughs> they have the, this interesting cosmology because they also understand what they refer to as the Dantian, as the center of the body. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned in the last show holography, the hologrammatic nature, holographic nature mm -hmm. of the universe. And the Chinese really kind of spell that out well in their basic understanding of the elements of life. Yes. Would you say? Absolutely, they do. And I think what's, what really distinguishes Chinese thought from Western thought is the integrated nature of everything that they do and that they think and that they teach. And that one thing will lead into another is going to affect another thing. Exactly. And that's that whole yin yang of the negative and the positive symbol that that energy is always flowing. And it's not just two pieces that are moving. One is transmuting into the other and then back and forth. So that symbol actually represents the, the, that dark shape, tear shape, with the light tear shape. So as it's moving, one 
they're turning into each other. Exactly. And that's what makes the movement of the energy. Exactly. And the same thing is true with every aspect of life. There's that balance and one thing is going to affect another. So as we look at our own lives and as we look at whatever transformation we want to make, it's important to look at how our life is connected to the greater circles of life around us. Exactly. It's understanding life basically as a gestalt. Mm -hmm. That there's sort of one being, if you will, one intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the little individual cells known as us, the chi just flows in like sap running in a tree, you know, mm -hmm. and it enlivens the individual leaves and branches. Uh, of which we are part. We are a branch of this great force called life, or in the French idea, élan vital, mm -hmm. in the Chinese, qi. Right. And it's the, it's the centerpiece, it's the centerfold mm -hmm. of the entire, it's the building block of the civilization. You know? Now, it's interesting because we, in this culture, uh, European and American culture, have this idea of, well, I want to be a doctor. And so you go and you study the sciences and medicine, mm -hmm. you become a doctor. And, or you um, want to be involved in sports. So you study physical education and you go in that direction. But in Chinese, to study one is to study all. They traditionally, as I know mm -hmm. you know, had this idea called the five excellencies. Mm -hmm. And that is someone who wanted to be a master of one thing had to be the master of all known knowledge at the time. Mm. So if one, one person wanted to become a physician, they had to be a master of calligraphy, poetry, literature, philosophy, and that became the basis for them becoming a good doctor because mm. they knew how to pay attention to detail. You know, with the brush stroke? Mm -hmm. And this is the way they learned. It wasn't just study medicine, that's just way too limited an idea. Not to mention, to be a good doctor means you also have to be a good chef. You have to know to combine the elements of mm -hmm. food since all the different foods relate to the different organs, exactly. as you well know. And if they relate to the different organs, then you're talking about eating a meal which is actually balancing the organs. There's no separation mm -hmm. from gastronomy fra to mm -hmm. medicine and the balancing of the organs, or from the movement practices like Qigong or Tai Chi Chuan. Absolutely true, absolutely true. And that's why um, Chinese medicine has so many aspects to it, even today. Yeah. You know, it may not have the same breadth of study as it did in ancient times. Mm -hmm. But in order to be a Chinese doctor, you do have to understand how herbs and foods affect the body, which foods will warm, which foods will cool, which, you know, so exactly. there's a lot to consider. Um, there the are seasonal things, right, there are purgatives, there's bitters and mm -hmm. sweets, so there's, there's really an enormous amount of information that a doctor of Chinese medicine has to understand to be a true doctor of Chinese medicine. Exactly. And of course it's interesting, things are changing now, but, um, and this is in ancient times, but just years past, a doctor was only paid if you stayed well. <laughs> that's right. If you were sick, they didn't get paid because <laughs> exactly. they weren't doing their job. That's right. So that's a whole different mindset. You bet. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different mindset. And furthermore, it went even a little dangerously further. If the physician to the emperor mm -hmm. uh, did not do his job properly, that is, the emperor got ill, then what? <laughs> literally yes. beheaded. Now, thank God that didn't happen very often. But, but, but it was, it did happen. Yes. And, and actually, if you look at Chinese culture, um, you know, thousands of years ago, you know, we, we look at it now and say, oh, there were these wonderful monks in the mountains meditating. Right. There was a lot of violence in that yeah. culture. Yep. And, you know, there were a lot of warlords and there was a lot of slaughter and there was a lot Fiefdoms. of... Fiefdoms. So there was a lot of yep. challenge to people of those times, hence the necessity for martial arts. Exactly. So, so there, there, that, and that's why you saw a lot of monks 
who, that created the martial arts. Shaolin because, boxing? Ab absolutely, because the, the monks, while they were in um, a place of, of cultivating their highest spiritual powers, so I'm, I'm not sure that they would have called them spiritual powers, mm -hmm. but while they were cultivating that... Cultivating their internal life, their chi. Yeah, they, they also had to stay alive. Mm -hmm. which meant they had to protect, defend themselves. And often they would become defenders of people. So it was, exactly. it was an important aspect of their culture that you know, there was no demonization of that kind of strength of being able to fight, being able to represent both sides of that balance, the soft, gentle, loving, tender, but there was also the necessity to be strong and disciplined and to be able to really move forward and defend yourself in the world. Exactly. So both aspects of our being are important and we need to look at both aspects without judgment and just really seek the balance. Exactly. The yin and the yang, mm -hmm. the masculine and the feminine. Now what's interesting, and uh, your comments fertilize this remembrance in me, in the Chinese view, the Taiji view, the soft overcomes the hard. Mm -hmm. The rock on the shore is ultimately worn down by the passage of the water of the wave on top of it. Mm -hmm. It is slow. It is the tortoise's way. Mm -hmm. But eventually the soft does overcome the hard. And this gives rise to an entire perspective mm -hmm. of the world that we don't have here. We think that brute strength is, and tension, and muscular development is strength. Mm -hmm. That's our definition of strength, in fact. And we have bodies that we admire that reflect that. Mm -hmm. The Chinese don't have any such thing. They have an idea of grounding and of bound. Watch, even go down to Chinatown and watch the Chinese walk. Mm -hmm. They have a center of gravity like nobody else. Old, young, middle, it doesn't matter. They walk differently because they have a sense of their body mm -hmm. that's just different than ours. We tend to be way more up in our heads. And they're down here in the Dantian, right. which is their center. And the point I'm making is that when you follow the physics of Tai Chi Chuan out mm -hmm. the martial art to its furthest extent, those monks way back, like you're speaking of, in defending the monastery or the temple, are doing so, but through softness. It's not through being muscularly tense and hard that they're defending their yin temple. Mm -hmm. It's because they know that the soft receives mm -hmm. and receives, and if someone is coming to them with strength, that they can use against their opponent. Mm -hmm. and if you translate some of the language of Tai Chi in, uh, into English, it's, I receive my guest, the opponent. Mm -hmm. I sit him down. You know, I <laughs> lead him this way. You know, I feed him some tea. You know, it's all very gentle and very loving. Mm -hmm. And yet, they're destroying the person. <laughs> yes. Not with their own strength. But with the person's but with aggression. The, exactly, with the other person's strength. Mm -hmm. And this is a lesson that I only wish our leaders could really cognize, really get. The soft always overcomes the hard. I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you on that, on that score. And also it's important for, for us to realize that this is true in every aspect of our life. Exactly. You know, that's what I was saying. It's, it's like a living practice that you can interpret in many ways. Mm -hmm. And even when you look at the, the martial arts themselves, not Tai Chi per se, because Tai Chi and Qigong are like cousins of the same family. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the more um, harder, the harder the martial arts. arts, they have forgotten their soft side, the underside, the strength the underbelly. Side. And so they when martial arts became very famous in this country, you know, in the 70s, and everybody Bruce thought it was Lee. really cool, you know, to yeah. punch and kick and do exactly. all those things. And then we developed all these martial arts schools that cultivated those arts. But by not giving them the foundation, created a lot of very sick 
broken bones. Exactly. <laughs> Practitioners, <laughs> students. You know, people became injured and broken down. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the truth of it is, if you look at some of the older masters of the martial arts, they're usually very sick. You know, they're kind of That's weak. Right. They're broken down. That's they're right. they're um, Yin. they're depleted, mm -hmm. um, and it's because they're constantly doing the aggressive and not supporting themselves yep. with these uh, regenerative arts. When I was in China, we st actually studied with one of the boxes of the national team, mm -hmm. and even though we were studying qigong, we wanted to know what the boxes do to, to do their sure. qigong. And they do a lot of the same practices, a lot of strengthening practices, but in order to actually study to become to that level, um, you know, they were teaching us a particular posture where you're like holding a, an iron ball in both hands, underneath both arms, and in your, or another huge one between your arms, and you have to be able to visualize, so which means you're feeling it for eight hours Ooh. before you learn the first bit of fighting skill. So they understand that you first have to cultivate and understand where your strength comes from before you can move into that arena where you can really function as a martial artist, yes. a true martial artist. And also what we don't understand here about the martial arts very often is that the the martial artists are often throwing away their chi. We have a, a powerful point in the palm called the lao uh -huh. gong. Uh -huh. So anytime you throw a, a, a hand chop or you hit something, if you don't know what you're doing, you're actually depleting your primary life, vital life force energy. So if you don't cultivate yourself and you practice the martial arts, you could end up with kidney failure and yeah. serious organ depletion. So yeah. it's an important aspect. It really is. Mm -hmm. It is said I have the great, great fortune to come into the practice of Tai Chi Chuan, both at Bard and continue down at Professor Ching Man Ching School in Chinatown mm -hmm. with Bob uh, Lumish and Lou Kleinsmith, both of whom were among the top students of Professor, mm -hmm. who passed in 1974. And this idea, Kathy, was always said that the martial arts begin and end with respect. Mm -hmm. And if you were to just think that the movies really gave an example of mm -hmm. what it's about, it, they do not. Mm -hmm. The opponents in a Taiji or Qi Kung, or any kind of martial, off, uh, martial art face-off, mm -hmm. is that they honor the Buddha nature or the true original self mm -hmm. of their opponent, it puts the entire thing onto a different plateau. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And while they are doing their best in the context, mm -hmm. they're honoring the highness of the other individual. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the samurai happen to be an interesting example of this because mm -hmm. while they would fight to the end, they loved the fight and the art of the fight. Mm. You know, and the strategy of it, and the cunning of it, and the soft versus the hard of it. And it happened many a time when one warrior would bring, I know I switched from China to Japan, but... But it's all the same. Japan, right, exactly. Japan is Evolution basically from the same thing. Uh, a copy of the Chinese culture mm -hmm. and refined somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, and, but they would bring the, the edge of the sword to the neck of their opponent and say... Do you want to die or do you want to live? Mm -hmm. And they didn't have to kill to win because they would just say, I surrender. Mm -hmm. Or kill me. Yeah. Whichever. Because their whole relationship to death is totally utterly different. different than ours too. It's totally different. But mm -hmm. the point being that the life could continue, but the battle was won. Mm -hmm. And it was clear among the fighters who won. Mm -hmm and they could live, you know, yeah. and it was honor and all sorts of things, but... Yeah, and they had their it was own the, code. It was, right, it was the cultivation of the art, right, exactly, yeah. they had their own code. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, another important piece of this is that we are talking, in a sense, about and around, is the, the ultimate idea, in my view, of what the Chinese have to give us from a spiritual and living, healthy living perspective, 
is this idea of internal alchemy, mm -hmm. of the transmutation of forces. And as you said earlier, so eloquently, you've got the yin and the yang, and one blends into the other constantly. Mm -hmm. And when one is at its maximum, it becomes the minimum of the next. Mm -hmm. And around and around it goes. So from that point of view, the internal alchemist, which is sort of the pinnacle, as far as I know, mm -hmm. of the Chinese practices, gives the individual an opportunity to actually cultivate, we say cultivate qi, but if one continues to cultivate qi, they're ultimately cultivating spirit, mm -hmm. which is just a refined matter. It's just the finer reaches of matter. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what we were talking about in the earlier show of the relationship of spirit to matter is truly one thing. Yeah. You know, it's just one of those things. It's the ultimate play. Mm -hmm. And so when one grounds oneself and sits or stands, because Qigong is an alchemy practice, mm -hmm. and experiences the Dantian and brings their mind to rest in the center, mm -hmm. they can begin to follow the natural circulation or with intention begin to direct the circulation. So it fills up the center, goes around to the kidneys, mm -hmm. and begins to permeate the meridians. And someone begins to really develop their own chi body, if you will. Would you like to say anything about that from your Qigong experience? Um, I think most Qigong practice has, like you said, as, as the center of the practice is the lower dentian. And the lower dentian is, is an energy field, but it's also an energy field that transcends our concept of space. So it exists yes. in our body and it exists multidimensionally into source and it also exists um, forward into the future. So it's like a multidimensional exactly. space. So as you focus your intention and your awareness and consciousness and bring your consciousness, it's like making your consciousness very ethereal, very light, very mm -hmm. feathery, so that you can actually become almost in that space. Like it's, it's surrounding dwell. you, you dwell in that mm -hmm. space. And so as you begin to dwell in that space, that means that your intentions can, can transform it. Exactly. And as you transform that core aspect of yourself, that means that you can um, change anything within your own body, within your own life, within your own experience. And you become a conscious co-creator of your own life is essentially what's happening. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. And we're not taught anything of this kind of mastery or role in the cultivation of energy or relationship with our organs mm -hmm. as there is in the Chinese way of looking. You know, one of the sad things that I experienced actually in China, while it was so rich being with the mountains and with the monks and practicing Qigong in the forests mm -hmm. um, and all of the sweetness, for me, one of the sad things, Kathy, was that the young people have no relationship, by and large, with the ancient ways. We knew words in Chinese mm -hmm. that they did not recognize which we know from the practices that we've been involved in and my practice of Chinese mm -hmm. medicine for many years, they don't even recognize the words. We had to explain classical Chinese words to the modern Chinese. Yeah, um, I remember sp speaking to one um, young person, not a child, but a, um, a young man. Mm -hmm. And he was, that's for old people. Yeah, exactly. I don't do Qigong because that's for old people. But I think like any young generation, they're going to look for something different. Um, for instance, Rock we, and roll. we seek the Eastern religions. And when I was there, a lot of people there were seeking Christianity. Yeah. So people tend to be drawn to other something that's <laughs> other than what they've been oppressed by. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective here in a country where we have certain freedoms, at least for the time, <laughs> and <laughs> then God we knows. can look upon their gifts and say, this is wonderful. Yeah. 
but they're coming from a society that's enormously oppressive and has always been. So they almost need to, in the, in, in the same yin yang, they have to go away from it to be able to come back to it. And, and just like with us, very often we have to leave our Christianity or the Judaism in order to be able to come back to the core principles. Exactly. So I trust that in the long run, we'll each find our way back to what we need to know. Exactly, I think so too. And each culture can also fertilize the other with what the other one doesn't know. Mm -hmm. That's you know, very true. It's just, you know. That's very true. Like, but, but you are true. There, there is a level of commercialism that's happening in China that's tragic. Yeah. That's and tragic. we see that they need to play out the same cycle mm -hmm. as we have done here. I've seen the same thing in India. Mm -hmm. You know, there is this fascination with material wealth, you know, and with convenience and with technology mm -hmm. and with cowboys and with movies and rock and roll and they just love it you know they just love it and it's understandable if you've ever gone to a roadside bathroom <laughs> yes <laughs> how important certain t forms of technology are. that's right like toilet paper <laughs> Indeed. so you know there needs to sure. be a balance but uh, like you said the real hope is that for the growing population the younger chinese generation that they'll be able to cherish what they have because it's exactly. a remarkably um, special gift that their culture is bringing to the world. Exactly. And as you are implying, each culture has something really important to bring to mm -hmm. each other. Okay. And um, they can certainly and are benefiting a lot from the richness of our culture. Mm -hmm. And we have been blessed, you and I and our students and, and patients over mm -hmm. the years, uh, uh, from what we've learned from the Chinese and the subtlety of thought, um, the understanding of the cosmos from this perspective, mm -hmm. the appreciation of the organs and the organs relationship to, to chi, mm -hmm. to bones, to blood, to flow, to food, mm -hmm. <laughs> and to movement are all one synthetic um, tapestry, if you will, mm -hmm. that we, I think, can stand to learn a lot from. I agree. I know it's, it's actually changed my life, and I know it's changed yours, mm -hmm. to simply dwell in the Chinese mode of seeing, mm -hmm. because your life can't be the same, because everything becomes integrated. And it, and it gives you a certain um, comfort, I find. Yeah. And even though my life becomes very chaotic and there's stress all around me, somehow I feel like I'm like at the center of that storm. And the chaos may be swirling around me, but internally I feel a comfort and a peace that I get from the practice. Yes. God, yes. Well, Dorothy was right, Kathy. There's no place like home. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So thanks again for mm -hmm. joining us here on A Better World. And I'm very happy to have been here yeah. twice. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So good, so good. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you've enjoyed all that as much as I have, and I believe both of us have. It's been rich to talk with you all about our experiences in China, but more than anything, sinking into the Chinese way of life, the perspective, and the practices and the relationship we have to Qi, and our relationship actually to our organs, and our very life itself that has been born from our practices. So for more information, just following the show, you will see ways of getting in touch with Kathy and I, so you can uh, learn more about what it is we have to offer. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. When you're doing Qigong practice, the important thing is to give yourself a nice supportive stance. So we separate our feet approximately shoulder width apart. And in order to maintain flexibility in the lower body, to keep your balance and to keep the energy flowing, soft bend into your knees. 
And then we want to also allow the spine to be stretched and upright and relaxed. If you put the back of your hand into the small of your back, you'll feel a curve. Tuck your buttocks under just a bit so that you can flatten your lower back. And your basic Qigong stance is to face the energy of your palms, the Lao Gong, if you bring your middle finger into the center of your palm, that's the Lao Gong point. And that's where we exchange, emit Qi and take Qi into the body. We want to face our Lao Gong into the lower Din Tian. If you place three fingers below your navel, where the bottom finger touches your body, that point of reference into the center is the lower Din Tian. So we take our palms and face them towards the lower Din Tian, separating our arms from our body, relaxing your wrists and relaxing your hands. So you want your hands to be very soft so that they actually flow from your wrists like water that's just flowing out of a nice stream or waterfall. So a very soft posture in order to build your chi. And the most basic exercise is simply to hold this stance. When you're holding a qigong stance, you don't want to have a stiff body. You don't want to try to stand straight. You become very organic. So your legs become like the trunks of a tree. Your upper body is very soft, very gently moving, as if the upper branches were blowing in a nice, gentle breeze. And as we're doing our Qigong practice, you want to take your breath down into the lower body and allow your abdomen to expand with each breath so that as you take the breath, your Qi becomes fortified and expands not only to fill the abdomen but to build the supportive Qi that's around your body. And a basic practice is to do the ocean breath. With the ocean breath, you take in a nice deep breath and your arms move away from the body gently as you inhale. As you exhale, they flow gently back. So that your own chi flows like an ocean traveling in waves out of your body as you inhale, flowing back into the body as you exhale and you allow your arms to relax almost as if they are surfing riding the crest of the wave of your own chi and your own breath. And then you can expand it a little bit more and as you open your arms Arch your back, open your chest, fill the lungs. As you exhale, bow the back, come forward a little bit so that your body, your chest, your arms, you yourself become a part of the same wave, opening. And then concentrating the energy. so that your whole body is in part and parcel with the breath. And we gradually allow the movements to become larger and then smaller, smaller and smaller as we keep breathing full breaths. And then finally allow your palms to be still in front of the lower Din Tian so that your energy can concentrate and become fortified to support you for the rest of your day. 
And this is a prop you can do for 5 minutes, for 10 minutes, 15, 20. It's a way of really building the energy into the lower dintian, expanding the lungs, bringing oxygen into your body. And as you're moving and breathing, you're also lymphocyzing, detoxifying the cells. And that's one of the beauties of the Qigong practice, is that it's a very slow, gentle practice. Let's practice for a moment first with our palms facing back. Allow your fingers to relax and your arms to dangle from your shoulders. And then we're going to just gently lift our arms upwards towards the sky. But it's very soft. Your arms are floating like clouds through the sky. Lifting gently. Breathe full as you lift. Relax and allow your arms to float gently down, almost like leaves floating from the tree in an autumn forest. Just allow yourself to be very organic and very gentle. And as we're doing this exercise, as we lift our arms, we're actually encouraging the earth to send energy vibrations up through our body, allowing it to strengthen the bones and bring vibrational minerals into our system. And as our hands gently float back towards the earth, we're drawing the chi from high in the cosmos, allowing that sense of relaxation and peace to just flow down through your body. So as you're doing an exercise, it may seem very simple, but what you're doing is you're integrating your being into the larger energies of the earth and the cosmos so that those energies can flow and support and transform the tissues of your own body. We're working energetically and through the physiology. Okay, so now I'm going to do uh, another basic movement that also helps to integrate the energy of earth vibration with cosmic vibration and allowing that energy to be brought into our bodies to help heal and move some of the blocks out of our system. And in this practice, again, we start with our arms resting at our side and take a moment to adjust your posture. Be sure that the knees are soft. Relax your hips and your pelvis. When we're doing Qigong practice, it's important to try to allow your body to be as relaxed as possible. So if you think of yourself as primarily a skeleton, our foundation is the skeleton. And the rest of our body is simply draped over that skeleton in the same way as a garment would drape itself over the hanger. So you move your body gently and softly without engaging the muscles tightly in order to create this soft and relaxed kind of movement. And as we're doing this nice, gentle, soft movement, our body is convinced, oh, it's time to rest. That means it's time to repair. So your body goes into a natural cellular repair. And also it puts you in a deep meditative state that allows you to be open and aware and allows your mind to have an interactive power with the physiology of your body. This particular exercise comes from Turtle Longevity Qigong. And we're simply opening our arms to our sides, very softly, very gently. And it's like becoming a weightless, moving, gentle being. And as our arms lift, we gently turn the palms up. And then join the energies, gathering them between our arms. And once you've gathered that energy into your arms, it's as if you're going to dive, but we dive upward reaching up, allowing ourselves to be embraced by the chi. Inhale deeply as you reach.
and then gather the chi as if to embrace and carry it back into your own being pouring it down through the center of your body through the crown and then we gently bathe ourselves with the chi allowing your hands to softly float down your body and the energy from your own palms reaches deep into your own body sweeping the meridians of debris and bringing the nourishment through allowing your hands to begin to regulate the organs internally as you gently bring them down the front of your body and then allow your arms to relax gently separating at your sides and then we want to integrate it take a nice deep breath but breathe with the whole body open and relax soften so that each cell becomes alive and again we lift our arms lifting joining bringing the earth's vibration up into our body and then we gradually mingle the earth's chi into the cosmic chi reaching into the source reaching into your higher being and then we gather harvest that chi by pulling it in between our arms and then we dive up and just embrace feel that energy flow down over the whole body inhale and then again we gather the harvest of chi pulling it towards the top of our head allowing the chi to flow down deep to the center of your body and then using your hands moving down gently bathing and guiding the energy through deep into your body nourishing the organs opening the meridians and relax again allowing your arms to rest at your sides and we take another deep breath And relax okay and now we can do another Qigong practice and this practice involves using your mind in order to guide the Qi through your body so what we're going to do first is focus our mind into the energy of our lower Din Tian and use the mind to gather the Qi into your lower Din Tian and then with your mind focusing on that energy we guide it in a path to the bottom of the torso and up through to the back into the tip of your spine and up along the spine to the base of your neck splitting flowing into your shoulders and down your arms to the palms of your hands and then we turn our palms forward and lift our chi then forming a ball of chi between our palms and splitting that chi we turn our hands down and then open to the side and then we point our fingers to two middle fingers and we're going to send our chi from fingertip to fingertip so first bending your left elbow and then going straight out with your fingers and as the left moves shift your shoulders 
bending the right elbow, then pointing with the right fingers, and then we can just gather our chi, flowing back across our shoulders from fingertip to fingertip. And then we can relax our hands, raising our palms up. And relax, bringing our energy back into the center of our body. Gathering it into the body and focusing again on the energy to the lower dintian. Relax your arms to your sides. Take a deep breath. And relax. Another movement that we can do to work the chi is to really allow your body to shift weight from side to side. Bring your palms into relationship with each other. And as we circle our palms, we're beginning to cultivate the movement of energy, the yin and the yang within ourself. And then we can begin to increase that dynamic by moving our arms into larger circles. But watch as the shoulder is in relationship to the hands and the hips move in relationship to the shoulders but the palms still stay in relationship with each other. So I lead with my left, lower the left and the right will follow to the top of the circle. I'll lead with my right, my left hand will follow. As the right hand descends, the left reaches the top of the circle and begins to lead so that your body begins to rebalance its heart with the positive and negative forces. One is not better than the other. It's the balance that creates the harmony in our life. And as you're doing this practice, you can separate into a horse stance and do a more extreme practice. And this is a movement also from Jade Body Qigong, and it represents the movements of the dragon. So you find yourself interpreting in your own way the movements of the dragon as it shifts and turns and creates in its movements the forces that we see manifested in our universe. And then as you've completed your movements, you gradually allow them to become smaller. Bring yourself back into a closer relationship. Legs a little bit closer. Hands and arms moving small. And then you can finally relax, bringing yourself once again in proximity with the energy of your lower dintian. And then always ending an exercise, meditating, focusing, and bringing our energies back to the center, the energy of your vital life force, the prenatal chi, the lower dintian. And after a moment of concentration, we always relax and take a deep cleansing breath. Allow the exhaled breath to release. And then you can go on with your day.
Hello and welcome back to A Better World. This is your host Mitchell J. Rabin and we're very glad you're joining us again today. Today we are going to continue with the series that we've begun on Taoist understanding, wisdom and practices. We've been looking at internal alchemy, we've looked at Qigong. Today we are going to talk about three subjects, at least in brief, that are usually not relegated to the domains of spirituality or religion, but are three of the most vital forces in our lives on planet Earth as human beings. And what are those? I think we all really know. They are sex, they are money and abundance, and they are power. We seem to have such issues, each person, each nation, through all of time, dealing with these three highly controversial, highly charged subjects, that it only makes sense that if we are seeking to create a better, a harmonious world, outside of ourselves, inside ourselves, that we really reckon with these three very topical subjects. It seems that they are the very basis of actually most archetypes that we have that our unconscious reflects upon, utilizes in our dreams, in the symbols of every single kind of ancient and contemporary piece of art in one way or another, whether it's overt or covert. It shows up in the imagery, in fairy tales, in mythologies across the world. There's always the subject of who has what, who has whom, who is involved with whom, and who has the power reigning over whom. So when we look from a Taoist perspective, we get some enrichment. We get in touch with a sense of wisdom from the source, and it can shed light and illuminate these subjects for ourselves and for the direction of us. So we will be relying upon the great master Lao Tzu, appropriately in a small little book, who the great poet Taoist is credited with actually beginning Taoism. He was said to have been running, uh, riding a an ox or a goat, the stories vary, outside of a town and the gatekeeper recognized him to be the great immortalist that he was known to be by some who were in the know and stopped him and said, I'm not letting you out of this town until you tell me everything you know. Hence, we are told, was the formation of this wonderful book of poetry, the Tao Te Ching. So we are blessed to have it uh, in English, uh, translated by many. Uh, the, the translation I most prefer is that of Stephen Mitchell. And um, it brings a tremendous ring of truth to us that we'll be reflecting on through this program. So first of all, I would like to, before consulting this directly, let's talk about the most abundant substance in the universe beyond hydrogen or air, um, and that is sex. We have a vitality about sex that charges through our body literally every day, almost for some, constantly throughout the day. There are entire psychologies that have been spun off, i.e. Freud, that says that Sex is the basis of all of our energies and it is underlying all of our human activities. We come back to the fount, you could say, of our own sex, sexual drive and sexuality. And what we then do to lead a civilized life is to sublimate, that is to direct in other constructive ways that raw, primal, sexual force, that energy. So we create great buildings, we produce great art, God willing, we make beautiful music, and we lead our lives day to day and provide for ourselves and our family. Now, interesting that among 
all subjects taboo among the great religious traditions of our world, sex is one of those things that is just verboten. You just don't talk about it if anyone is found in a, some kind of position in the hierarchy of the Christian or other, other religions to be um, cavorting in sexual ways with one's parishioners or what have you, they are ousted. Well, actually, more recently, they've been covered up. But when one finds out a little bit about another person's sex life, and if that person is in any kind of position of power or prominence, everything begins to slowly fall apart. So it's very interesting. The power of sex is so great. There's something just underneath the surface for everybody of great curiosity, of great interest, of great secrecy. So it's shrouded in our larger institutions and kept quiet. Or on the other hand, thoroughly and completely exploited, let's say, by the commercial media that seeks to use it to sell everything from hair driver, dryers to toothbrushes or cars or alcohol. It's the driving force behind sales in virtually every place just about that we see on this planet. So psychologists know the power of this and they are hired by advertising agencies to utilize in the subtlest and sometimes not so subtle ways the power of this maddening driving force. And indeed, What's interesting about Taoism to me, one of the many features of it, is that rather than shunning the power of sexuality and suppressing it or oppressing it or repressing it or denying it, it actually says, sex, beautiful, let it flower. In fact, there are many texts over thousands of years that have been written about the magnificence of the sexual relationship between men and women, and certainly not only, but that uh, the focus, because we have yin and we have yang, and their interface, their union, their sacred combining is really the subject of Taoist internal alchemy, and whether that is represented by the yin of a female and the yang of a male, or it's internal inside one person, Individually, in a sense, it doesn't matter. What matters is that there is always this interplay between yin and yang, between the feminine and the masculine of all of life. And that is the subject of Taoist sexual practices. The marriage, of you, if you will, the perfect blending of these forces inside one's own being allows for the perfect marriage and therefore the full holistic awakening and consciousness of a given individual. So rather than shunning, as I said, the power of sex and making it bad and wrong and guilt-ridden and sinful and God knows what, they have taken the glory of its power and the strength of it and said, look, it's obvious to one and all that this is virtually the most powerful power on the planet. Why not use it? Let's use it for our enjoyment and let's use it for our spiritual awakening, what we call cultivation, the cultivation of qi. So the Taoists over the years have developed an entire body of practices, of exercises, of meditations that all are about the exchange of energy based on sexual attraction between primarily opposites to bring chi up into the bones, into the dantian, which is the center, meaning elixir field, and circulating it through the body, up through the crown and down, tracing what we call the microcosmic orbit. And when two people do this together, 
you have a magnificent orgasmic experience. And I don't mean just the orgasm that we usually discuss or conceive of when a person has sex, but we are talking about a much broader, larger, more encompassing, how will I say it, spiritual orgasm. Yes, it's bodily, God knows, and yet it is permeating the very tissue, the tendons, you could say, even the cartilage, the bones of a person. When you build the chi, long before even two people touching, and many of the exercises involve a man and a woman sitting cross-legged facing one another, meditating, and beginning to circulate energy, chi, around themselves individually first in what is called the microcosmic orbit, which we will go into in a later program, and then begin to form an egg, as it were, a cosmic egg, which includes them both. But meanwhile, they're looking at each other. Meanwhile, they're appreciating one another. Meanwhile, they're allowing the sexual energy to begin flowing between them. And what, of course, happens is arousal, and the enjoyment of that arousal, and the cultivation of that arousal. And before you know it, there can be touch, direct touch. But at first, you're playing in the etheric field, you could say, the energy field, outside the body. And it's just so interesting to explore this realm of sexual interplay. In fact, it could be said that touching doesn't even need to take place. Sex could be taking place across a room, through a glance. And, of course, it becomes all the richer as we get bodily closer to one another. But the idea is that when there are respectful stages of increased intimacy between the parties, then we have a more sacred union that becomes possible. Anyway, I'm just going to touch upon this in this segment so I can go on to the other two, uh, time allowing, and um, return to this in a much more thorough way in some programs, and you're welcome to join us then. The point being that just underlying it all in utter, complete contradistinction from any other tradition, save somewhat the Buddhist, that I know, wisdom tradition, religion, uh, in the world, only the Taoists seem to show the appreciation of the domain of sex, sexuality, sensuality, and utilize it for increased spiritual awakening and awareness and building one's what we call chi body. In fact, they have a series of practices. In fact, some of them are outlined very well by Montauk Chia in this book, Cultivating Female Sexual Energy. And there is the counterpart, of course, Cultivating Male Sexual Energy, which help a woman own her body uh, there is a whole chapter on ovarian power, for instance, and developing a relationship to one's, to one's ovaries and to one's womb and to one's, all one's genitals and sexual parts, as well as to expand the whole idea of sex to one's entire body, including, as I've been saying, energy body. So here we see how the Taoist way offers us a total embracing of life. It's not segmented, it's not moralized upon, it's not segregated in one way or another or compartmentalized. It's really brought together the whole of life in all of its magnificent array and splendor. So when we look, we see the next major thing that we all deal with in this life if this is the subject of abundance or prosperity or money, as it translates into our, our uh, current currency. And it's something that, especially in our urban lives, we all must deal with. And we're always confused 
and conflicted about what's right and what's not in this regard. How do we make money? How do we attract money? Is it good or is it evil? Is it something that we should have lots of? Should we have just enough to get by? What is the story? For this, I would like to uh, consult the great Lao Tzu because he just has so many words of wisdom to share with us that I feel can help to, no pun intended, enrich our understanding. So here are a few words. The supreme good is like water, which nourishes all things without trying to. It is content with the low places that people disdain. Thus it is like the Tao. In dwelling, live close to the ground. In thinking, keep to the simple. In conflict, be fair and generous. In work, do what you enjoy. In family life, be completely present. When you are content to be simply yourself and don't compare or compete, everyone will respect you. Number nine, fill your bowl to the brim and it will spill. Keep sharpening your knife and it will blunt. Chase after money and security and your heart will never unclench. Care about people's approval and you will be their prisoner. Do your work, then step back. The only path to serenity. So, you hear some interesting um, notions already presented in just a couple of lines from our dear Lao Tzu. And it's not um, summed up his view of abundance, prosperity, money in those lines, but that gives you some angle. This whole idea of filling to the brim and then it spills. It's this natural, beautiful simplicity of truth. We know that it spills. We know that when the cup is too f it runneth over. Tao speaks of that. Zen speaks of that. It's just so. And yet, it seems that the values embraced in our society are just those. Fill, 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 fill. More is better. Actually, here, less is more. That's the ancient Chinese wisdom. If you want to become whole, let yourself be partial. If you want to become straight, let yourself be crooked. If you want to become full, let yourself be empty. If you want to be reborn, let yourself die. If you want to be given everything, give everything up. The Master, by residing in the Tao, sets an example for all beings. Because he doesn't display himself, people can see his light. Because he has nothing to prove, people can trust his words. Because he doesn't know who he is, people recognize themselves in him. Because he has no goal in mind, everything he does succeeds. <laughs> Very interesting. Very interesting. It's so unlike the way we were taught. And it's not to say that what we have been taught has no value. It's just it has to be seen in context. It's almost like you want to take an aerial view. You want to get some altitude on what you've been taught over the years from childhood on and get some leverage on it, get some altitude on it and look at it, if you will, from a higher perspective to see if it really obtains any longer in your life, whether it ever obtained, whether it was something that was worth keeping or worth discarding. And what Lao Tzu is suggesting is that each and every one of us knows in our hearts what really is so. The discernment takes place here. Taoism is just the name of 
a series of practices that many naturalists, shamans and the like have, have developed and cultivated over many hundreds and actually thousands of years of practice, living in the woods, protecting themselves, providing food for themselves and for their brothers and their sisters. And they have formed a compendium of understandings, of wisdom teachings, of poems that can help to guide others in this day when we have so lost our mooring. The great Tao flows everywhere. All things are born from it, yet it doesn't create them. It pours itself into its work, yet it makes no claim. It nourishes infinite worlds, yet it doesn't hold on to them. Since it is merged with all things and hidden in their hearts, it can be called humble. Since all things vanish into it and it alone endures, it can be called great. It isn't aware of its greatness. Thus, it is truly great. Ah, <sighs> okay, you're getting it. You're getting it. Number 33. Knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. Mastering others is strength. Mastering yourself is true power. If you realize that you have enough, you are truly rich. If you stay in the center and embrace death with your whole heart, you will endure forever. Now those two little paragraphs talk about of course, both the idea of power and prosperity. And what is true power and what is not. And the distinction is made, as you heard, between strength and power. In fact, Lao Tzu wrote this book, spoke this poem, in order to help leaders lead. That was the basis of the book. It's about governance. It's about government. First and foremost, it's about self-government. Can I govern myself? Can I know myself? Can I have some mastery over my life, my being, and my essence? Having accomplished some level of that, then I can begin to speak about dealing with others. And, and what you'd call power or leadership among others. It's so interesting right now as we are dealing with very serious internationally rich and tense issues between nation to nation, who should rule who, and who has the authority. Is it an elected body like the United Nations, which is rather humble in general, that is a collection of everyone, or is it the United States that's going to be the policeman of the entire world? These are very troubled times. They need true leadership. And that's something, unfortunately, it looks like we're ne not getting a lot of, which is why I always say to turn to the words of Lao Tzu at a time like this is so very important. Let's see, what do we have here? Whoever relies on the Tao in governing men doesn't try to force issues or defeat enemies by force of arms. For every force, there is a counterforce. Violence, even well-intentioned, always rebounds upon itself. The master does his job and then stops. He understands that the universe is forever out of control and that trying to dominate events goes against the current of the Tao. Because he believes in himself, he doesn't try to convince others. Because he is content with himself, he doesn't need others' approval. Because he accepts himself, the whole world accepts him. You know what? That almost says it all. But I will turn just for a little bit of the next. Weapons are the tools of violence. All decent men detest them. Weapons are the tools of fear. A decent man will avoid them, 
except in the direst necessity, and, if compelled, will use them only with utmost constraint. Peace is the highest value. If the peace has been shattered, how can he be content? His enemies are not demons, but human beings like himself. He doesn't wish them personal harm, nor does he rejoice in victory. How could he rejoice in victory and delight in the slaughter of men? He enters a battle gravely, with sorrow and with great compassion, as if he were attending a funeral. So that is what we're dealing with when we look at the world, look at the universe from the view of the Tao. Man, heaven, and earth. These combine in a way to be alchemically transformed inside of us using the power of love, the power of sex, the power of the human heart in conjunction with the richness of nature, the bounty of nature, to take what it is we need, not to go over the brim, and when it comes to matters of governance, to first learn to govern ourselves, to tame our own minds, and then with love in our heart, humility in our soul, to then offer to be of some leadership to others. Anyway, I hope this has been somewhat helpful to you to understand the larger picture of the Tao and the way it embraces these otherwise seemingly controversial subjects of sex and sexuality, of money and power. And we'll see, and we do see, that from a Taoist point of view, they all truly blend into a harmonious and organic whole. And that is the way our lives can be. Thanks so much for joining us. This is Mitchell J. Rabin for A Better World, and I'll be continuing all of these subjects in subsequent programs. So please join us next week and in further, uh, further um, programs so you can uh, enjoy the riches of what we have to offer. Thanks so much, and I look forward to seeing you all next week.